My name is Chris Barnby. Among other things, I've written a book on a history of the Civil War, looking at the uh, Second World War largely from below, from the ordinary people fighting back. And in terms of uh, memory, I was brought up with really two narratives about the Second World War. One was the official British narrative, and secondly, what my parents told me. So my parents, for instance, my father told me that Winston Churchill was a bastard, that we needed a bastard to fight the bigger bastard, Hitler. Uh, and I was told some of my dad's experiences. He was in the Royal Navy, for instance, visiting India, where he was shocked at the racism against Indian people by the British. And he understood that there was a war, yes, against fascism, but the British were also fighting to preserve a British empire. And so there was two different narratives there, which I was brought, uh, brought up with. But in examining this book as well, I'm trying to look at the, the fact that the Second World War was, yes, it was a war involving the major powers fighting each other, but it was also a people's war in the sense that across much of Southern Europe in particular, and in Asia, powerful resistance movements emerged against the occupation by the, German, uh, by the Germans. In Europe, most significantly in Yugoslavia, which liberated itself. In Italy, where all the great cities of northern Italy, Turin, Flor uh, Milan, Genoa, uh, Venice, were liberated by the resistance, not by the British or the Americans. And Paris, for instance, which was liberated by an insurrection in August 1944. This is a history which has largely not been told in the Anglo-Saxon narrative of, the, se uh, of the, 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 second, uh, the Second World War. And I think it's important to, re to remember the fact that there was popular resistance to fascism inside those countries. And in the context of today's discussion about the impact of the Spanish Civil War, also to remember that people who'd fought in Spain, Spanish, Catalan, or others, played a very important role in those resistance movements. That was particularly the case, actually, in France, where so many of uh, the, uh, the exiles, had been, people who fled, had been jailed and then were kept in the camps until the Germans uh, eventually arrived. But they managed to flee, joined the resistance, and played a very important role in the French resistance. That was largely ignored after the war by de Gaulle, who wanted to portray a vision of it just simply being the French against the Nazi occupation. And the role of the Spanish, who played a cutting edge of this, was very, very in, important. And indeed, if people had fought in Spain, the very first killing in Paris by Colonel Fabian, Colonel Fabian had fought in the International Brigade. So there's a continuity between what happened in Spain and what happened in the Second World War, particularly in France. And tragically, so many of those people who had fought in the resistance in France, the, the Catalan and Spanish Basque resistance, believed that in 1945 they would return across the Pyrenees and carry out a similar guerrilla war backed up by the British and Americans. They believed the parachutes would keep coming with the weapons. And of course, that never happened because the British and Americans made their peace with Franco very, very, uh, very, very quickly. So the, the tragedy of that is something, again, I think we need to remember all the different uh, elements uh, uh, of that. The memories, of course, the direct memories are beginning to die as the generations who fought in the Second World War die. But they've left behind much, you know, maybe just the level of folklore. In my case, family pictures, medals, various uh, things like that stories they've passed on. But also, there's quite a wealth of reminiscences, people's memoirs and reminiscences, various things like that. And I think it's important we try and bring that together from across, across, I'll say Europe, but I should say as well, Asia as well. We shouldn't forget, again, powerful resistance movements right across Asia, into China, Indonesia, Malaysia, and China, China itself. I'd like to see that come together uh, and bring together that common memory of a people's war against fascism and Nazism, because it's what I say in my book, at the very beginning of the book, both of my parents volunteered in 1939. My father left the Communist Party because of the Hitler-Stalin pact. He wanted to fight fascism. And for them, that war was against fascism. And what they saw in 1945, the newsreel from Belsen, confirmed that what they'd done had been right. They knew the war was different from Winston Churchill. Winston Churchill was fighting for the British Empire. Joseph Stalin was fighting for the interests of Russia. You know, they knew that, but they still get, and I think we need to keep that memory alive, that people saw it as a war against fascism and there's that popularity. And at the end of the war in this country, there was a huge thirst for change. And that's why in 1945, a Labour government, 
to the shock of Winston Churchill, was elected, which created the National Health Service, the welfare state, things we still enjoy in Britain today. They were the gift of that generation. The people who had fought in the Second World War fought fascism, and they handed down to us something that I think today we need to cherish. Uh, I think that, that it's been left largely unofficial, uh, but we have had memories of, uh, of that. For instance, the way that the Home Guard, which is almost a militia formed in 1940 in case of German invasion, the way it was portrayed was very much as, as an auxiliary of the regular army. It's since come out that, for instance, the man who initially trained the Home Guard in the west of, uh, west of London was a man called Tom Wintringham, who would fought in the international brigades. And he wanted to give them a spirit of guerrilla warfare as a way of resisting any possible German attack. He was teaching them guerrilla warfare. At that stage, the British officer corps and Churchill got very nervous about this. It's not something they particularly wanted. So they changed that. But a biography of him has appeared. And there's an interest as well, I think, in some of the other uh, resistance movements. I think I'm very pleased that one of the definitive histories of the Italian resistance by Claudio Pavone has been uh, published now in English, which opens up for an English audience. There's been a number of other books. A friend of mine, Tom Bean, published a book called the Italian Resistance. There's been a number of other books which have emerged uh, about that. And indeed, there are memoirs of Brit British prisoners who were released in 1943 when Mussolini fell, who then joined the Italian resistance. And there are memoirs of British SOE soldiers sent into Italy to work with the resistance, which have been published, which now become available, which give people here in this country a sense of what was happening in Italy. There's this huge resistance movement which mushroomed after 1943 against, uh, against uh, fa uh, fascism. And we still don't know enough about what happened in Yugoslavia, and we certainly don't know enough what happened in the Philippines, Indonesia, Indonesia, much of that unknown, but there were huge resistance movements to Japanese occupation.